That was fun, tuning the equipment and getting it all dialed in for what you need as a driver, GTP at the <laughs> Nürburgring and Watkins Glen and, and driving the Ferrari. I mean, what was the best part of today for you? Driving, yeah. that, always the best part. Um, more, it, it, I, I love getting behind the wheel, love getting that uh, adrenaline going, that adrenaline fix. There's nothing like driving a GTP at Nürburgring. Things are happening really fast. For me personally, there's nothing like driving a prototype at Daytona, you know, as, as many miles as I have around, around that place and uh, all the wins with the Rolex 24 and, and all the other great racers there. And, um, and, and coming back and working together with Motion. It's that technology that we're continually driving forward. Yeah. And, and as we are able to refine it uh, and focus on it and then it tune it. I mean, being able to get, get more of that, that tuning, um, like with the GTP car, it, it, it felt too soft, too, you know, more movement than it needed, and then be, be able to really pinch that down and yes. um, and be direct with that with that movement. So that driver feedback is is more that that pure uh, feedback that that we're wanting as a as a driver for reality, right. um, ultimately to be immersed because that's the name of the game. You know, today was about enhancing the product. Today is about you know getting feedback from. I mean, let's, let's be real here. You're probably one of the most decorated race car drivers in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So we very much value all of our drivers' input. And for someone that has grown up uh, with no simulation training and then being at the forefront and the pinnacle of, of the cutting edge side of the simulation world and getting laughed at along the way, like, oh, ha, 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 yeah, funny, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then now it's commonplace. You know, one of the things that we've always said about our technologies, if it doesn't feel real to our pro drivers, it doesn't belong in our equipment. The changes that you've seen in the simulation industry, what, what's been the biggest advantage going from non-motion to motion to SimCraft technology? Like, how have you seen it evolve so much? Like, what's been the biggest technological you know, change that you've seen? It's, it's, it's very much like beads on a necklace. Right, so you, you, you put all these beads on a necklace and when you're done, you pull it all together and you have this beautiful necklace. And it's the same thing here. You couldn't do one thing without the other. So developing good pedal technology, mm -hmm. developing good steering technology, you know, let's, you know, whether you call it bass or, or you know, that kick in, the, kick in the butt that you get from, vib from that vibration, it, it, it's much needed. So when you sit in a race car and you fire it up, just sitting, even before you move, have that vibration that's going on in the car if it's a you know old v8 it's ka -kunk, ka -kunk, ka -kunk, ka -kunk, or if it's a you know a, a tw twin turbo v6 mm -hmm. um, that vibration is, is critical and so it's all those components together and now fast forward to movement because I did start in that, te that technology where man you had to shut everything off because if it was wrong the car was broken and at least that's what my brain was telling me and so the critical element of all this is immersion. So your brain thinks that it's reality of driving a car and the feel and the sensation for the input of what the tracks are like and the, the more of those movements that are correct, then the better reality for the driver, whether he's training to go to a track he hasn't gone to before, whether he's training to go back to the track that, that they're racing at in two weeks or three weeks or mm -hmm. whatever the case might be. All those pieces come together um, with this continual move of technology that we're developing here. That is, that's the bottom line because the, the better the movement is, the better the visuals are, the better the vibration is, the better, all those elements that go into when I'm sitting there in a race car and I'm going around the track and I have all these inputs that are, go that are going on, all of them need to be correct. Mm -hmm. And that's the continual effort that we're making here to get that, that level. And we're not stopping. 
I mean, we're continually pushing that envelope and, and coming here today, I think is going to be great for our customers as well, because developing some of those basic platforms, basic setups, basic fields, now we can give that to our customer and say, hey, Scott developed this, helped develop this on Daytona or Watkins Glen or, or Nürburgring. Right. And, and so when an amateur, uh, a novice, plugs and plays that, they know that that base setup is good so they can really focus on, on their driving. The professional level, all the manufacturers have, have their own sims that they spent five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars on. But for, you know, for your gentleman drivers, for, for your up and coming young talent, uh, for drivers that want to get back and, and just do a little driving like myself, uh, maybe, maybe a retired guy or maybe somebody that wants to stay sharp but just doesn't have a ride that year. Right. There is no other way to do it than, than simulation because if you can afford to go to the track, then, then you'll probably run, be running a team of your own. Because when you look at racing now, all testing is limited across the board, right? No matter who you are, and and so how how are you going to go and 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 do laps? You know, what, how are you going to go to the racetrack and and how are you going to get those laps and how are you going to do those things that, that I did? I mean, when I signed on with with Firestone and Patrick and did all those tests, and we did thirty thousand test miles of tires. That's that's a lot of testing. Right. And so what's the next best thing? So you, to me, you look at Sims two ways. You look at the Sim that is, that is owned uh, independently by a driver, enthusiast, uh, recreation, novice, amateur, whatever. And then you, then you look at the manufacturers who use them as a viable tool. They load all the, they're total data hogs. You know, they're, they're building their whole cars in this. So all the geometries, horsepower, torque curves, aero maps, everything goes, goes in. Right. Um, because we need that data to come, come out um, with any better understanding of different changes that we would make in lieu of going to the racetrack testing. And so peeling those two pieces apart, there's, there's a lot of, you know, the reality of spending 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 dollars on a sim is very different than five million, 10 million, and a room for, full of guys right. that are working right there with you. Right. And so some bleeds together, and some are independently um, continuing to move themselves forward, um, like stuff uh, w w which I see here with SimCraft. The movement, uh, the sensation, the ability to fine tune that to reality, uh, and then it reacts in a very real way, that's the payoff. I mean, that, that is the payoff. And so when you sit there behind the wheel and you go and drive at whatever speed you want to drive, you're, you're racing and, and continue to work on, on your abilities, your brain is immersed and you come away from it. I mean, well, the adrenaline has settled down finally, um, but after about three or four laps at Nürburgring in and, and a GTP car running, you know, high fives, low six minute laps, I come away and not only, you know, is that adrenaline rushing, but you got the shakes and, and I mean, it feels like you've been driving. We tuned the car. We tuned the, not only did we tune the physical characteristics within iRacing to make the car in the software react as you wanted it, but then we matched the physics from the chassis to what you need as a driver. We started at a baseline and fine-tuned it to what your brain needed as a driver to give you the most amount of immersion possible. When was the last time you had that type of experience in a car? That's the only pure sense of, of getting that. So how do we, how do we replicate that uh, as a viable tool? And I keep coming back to a viable tool because there's a big difference between arcade game. Arcade game, you want something that's got a lot of movement and it's fun or it's you know, entertainment, where when you're using something effectively as a tool, which we've been doing in the industry, all the manufacturers are using effectively as a tool. All the teams want to be involved. All the teams want a piece of the action. Right. And all of them want the unfair advantage. And so now we're seeing teams not only working with the manufacturers, but starting to do some more stuff on their own. And that is an effective tool. And, and as we're implementing uh, our systems more with, with, with teams and serious drivers at that level, 
um, that continues to keep us razor sharp and what we need moving forward for for the movement, for the visual, for the vibration, you know, across the board to give us a brain that can be immersed and think it's sitting behind a real steering wheel. In the other tech that you've been in, does anything that you've driven before in a simulated environment have the versatility and the tunability to get to that level? No. Like, or do you go into it like, well, it's good enough and is that good or bad? for your feedback. The, you know, everybody, all the manufacturers have their belief on what they're doing and it's based off of, some, some are doing a lot of the work themselves. Some are relying on uh, a supplier to do all this work. And it's been interesting, you know, driving for the different manufacturers and driving all the different, sim I've driven a lot of different mm -hmm. sims around the world. Mm -hmm. And they all have their view of how they, they're, they're trying to get to the same right. spot. Yeah it becomes very complicated and it becomes very cumbersome. And with some of those systems, they're needing a room full of people to back, to back them up on trying to get that technology, which in some of the stuff that I've driven in the past, um, just, it, just, it wasn't, just wasn't there. Now that you're a part of what we're doing here and mm -hmm. helping us out in levels that we've never been to before, which we really appreciate, and you have the CT chassis at home, which mm -hmm. is our small footprint unit. Yep. How would you relate that version of our model of the small footprint compact trainer to everything else that you've driven, not even the Apex 6, just the unit mm -hmm. that you have at home as far as fidelity, accuracy, and what you need? It's the best of what I've run. Um, and, it's, and it's the continual of working together with you guys. Um, it's great with iRacing, but it has its limitations. No disrespect to iRacing, I think they're doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. um, our Factor Pro, it's a, that's a very old system, that's kind of what we based our initial platform off of. So you have this, this driver that is running everything that, that continues to get better. You know, everything iRacing is doing is going to continue to get better, and it challenges us um, with SimCraft to do a better job at what we're doing, because as the fidelity gets better, we're able to recreate uh, a more of a pure environment uh, when you're sitting behind a wheel. And I haven't been involved with any other in and around, haven't dro drove any other sims that I would feel at this level with the movement, with, with the interaction, uh, with the inputs that all these different things we're talking about give me to make it feel like, yeah, this is making me feel like, you know, I'm sweating under, under the arms, I got adrenaline going and my brain's thinking I'm out there. Um, driving at you know, Daytona or Watkins Glen or wh whatever the track might be. Now the Apex 6 has all six degrees of, of freedom on it, so, um, but we really focused on the yaw and the pitch. You know, I would argue that those are probably the, most, the two most important motion cues for a driver and what they need to feel the, the right amount of rotation of the vehicle to work on their counter steering skills and know what's happening under full lock and how squirrely the car gets out from underneath them, which is, which is really the, the premise and the approach to the version that you have at home, the CT model, mm -hmm. which is yaw and pitch. Yeah. And your experience at home has been amazing, yes? It's been phenomenal. I mean, it's great to have another level, but it's an effective tool at that level. And the nice thing is, with the, with the one I have at home, a bit smaller, a little bit more compact, and a lot easier to move around. So I can take it, I've taken it over to the racetrack, I've taken it to Sonoma, I've taken it to Laguna, let right. some other guys drive it, right. you know? Get it out there and, and just like we did with Jimmy Johnson, get, you know, get guys behind the wheel, because at the end of the day, drivers are gonna believe in it or not. And if it's, if it's a good product, and guys enjoy driving it, and come away going, oh my gosh, I need one, that's the, that's the name of the game, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm seeing. Every time I expose people to it, and get them behind the wheel, they come away just amazed. So your version at home with just yaw and pitch, mm -hmm. is that all you need as a driver, just yaw and pitch? For, uh, for the level of what we're doing right now, I think, that's, I think it's perfect. I've seen some of the sims in here where you're doing aircraft simulators and some other stuff. Now, obviously, that, that next degree opens things wide open for, uh, for that level of, uh, of trainer, mm -hmm. uh, a simulator. For racing, I can say that all the feedback that I've, that I've gotten back it's, uh, it, it's great. Um, it, it feels very real. Um, you know, you look at brake bias and some drivers want a little bit more forward or a little bit further back, or you got a sway bar, one guy wants, you know, a little stiffer, a little, sure. a little softer. Uh, and same thing with motion. There won't be any big swings, but it's, it's something that's, 
that uh, it's very intuitive to jump in and, and make some adjustments to it so you can get it right in that window. Because at the end of the day, it's all about immersion. If your brain thinks it's reality uh, as you train on, uh, on these vehicles, then you'll come away with uh, better results and less frustration. If you get on your sim and all you do is crash the thing and it's frustrating because it didn't feel like reality and then you're trying to figure out how to make it feel like reality but it's something you really can't get anyway, then, you, then you're just shut off to the whole thing. That was the one comment that when Jimmy Johnson drove our yeah. equipment, that was the one piece of feedback that he gave us is that he had a non-motion equipment at home and couldn't put two laps together because right. it's, he drove, always drove on feel. Yep. And to learn a new process and pick something up that he's not really been exposed to because of the amount of exposure that was happening in the simulation world during the 2020 to 21, mm -hmm. those years, it's, it was interesting to watch people who have just driven on field not be able to pick up iRacing with a static piece of equipment at home. Yeah. Have you been in a lot of static non-motion technology? I've been in, and like how, yeah. quick, how quickly <laughs> were you able to grasp it? Like how long did it take for you to acclimate to it? Well, realize my first sim was one that we developed, uh, myself and another gentleman at Sonoma, back in 2012. Um, I'm, I was driving sim stuff and coming up with sim stuff before it was popular. He, was, he would write code. I'd tell him what this feels like reality. He'd write code. I'd feel, you know, this is good, this is bad, this is, let's change this, let's do this. And that's how we move forward. Um, we did have the access for very limited motion, but all of it was, it was the wrong motion, so it felt like the car was broken, mm -hmm. so you shut that system down. Uh, there was force feedback wheels that weren't very good, so he ran without force feedback because it's doing things you don't want it to do right. at the wrong time. And, right. and, and when I can tell you as a professional race car driver, if things aren't happening the way they should, the, the first thing you'd want to do is either, either turn it off or get out of it. And because it's frustration, I mean, because I know what reality, I mean, that's what you're working on today is, is the reality of what should this feel like getting around Daytona? What should this feel like at Watkins Glen? What should this feel like at Nürburgring? And I can come away from it and the driver going, oh yeah, that's, that's dang close. Mm -hmm. I mean, so my brain is thinking it's reality. Um, disclaimer, I would be, if I was training for a race, I'd have gloves on, suit on, head, you know, right. uh, helmet on, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Uh, really get that next level of immersion but for doing what we're doing here, getting that opportunity to uh, fine tune uh, the yaw and the heave and, and, and some of the other aspects, getting your brain to think that it is immersed, uh, that's key. At, at the end of the day, that's, that's what you need uh, from Sims. And when you can't get that, it becomes incredibly frustrating. And then it's like, I'm out. I don't even want to get in that thing again. A lot of people are searching for professional level simulation equipment. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people looking for us and a lot of people, you know, traffic coming to our website and, you know, going down the path of product evaluation. Any recommendations to those individuals that don't know about driving this yet coming from a professional race car driver like yourself? We just tuned this thing yeah. for you and your unit at home is tuned for you. Your seat time is your seat time. Yeah. And when people understand the versatility of the product level, your unit at home can turn into this Apex 6 because it's modular. Mm -hmm. where, where do you recommend starting? Well, for what I have at home, I think it, it's, it's, it's a great place to start because I can move it around. I've taken it to the track. Um, I let other guys drive it um, because that's, that's the reality. Um, do you want an arcade game or do you want a serious tool that's gonna let you get to the next level as a driver, um, going to a new track, mm -hmm. um, getting ready to go back to a track you haven't been to in a year, um, or, or just working on hand-eye coordination or just that input, because you know, typically through the winter, you're not doing a lot of driving. With all the restrictions from all the governing bodies, you cannot test how is a driver gonna be effective mm -hmm. doing that. And it's the reality of, of serious sims like, like this. Uh, and that's the only level uh, and way that you are going to, to get there um, because everything else is no more than an arcade game. In your professional opinion, mm -hmm. what's the downfall of not having the reality underneath you? Like what, what can you learn from a static environment and what is good and bad about that environment as it, as it relates to learning? I think 
just like in any, everything else, you have to have a foundation. And non-moving simulators, I think, give you a great foundation. And for some drivers, like myself, I don't come from a racing background, I don't come from money, so I had to come up with whatever I could over the years at whatever level yeah. of what I could afford and, and what was out there for me to be able to use. You're gonna do what you can do at the level you can do it. And, and if your best way to get into the sport is through a, a non-moving, then, then that's what you have to do. Now, as you continue on and become at a very high level, very professional level, teams, manufacturers, sponsors, you, you are driven to perform. And as a team, if you're not performing, and Chip told me this all the time, he said, if you're not winning races and winning championships, I need to get rid of you because I can't get sponsors. And I spent 13, 14 years with that man, won, I don't know, I think five championships together, 40, 40 wins, um, because he always drove all his team to the next level to get that unfair advantage, to get whatever he needed for the engineers, for the drivers, for the guys over the wall. And inclusive of that was, you know, being involved with sims and, and relying on the drivers to train at the level, whether it's a physical level of weights, uh, uh, reaction time, or the reality of sitting behind a, a vehicle like this and, and getting the reality of driving. Okay, you brought up, a, you brought up something major here the development of athletic performance, mm -hmm. okay? Um, do you feel that you need to have some sort of athletic skill set in order to manhandle a race car? <laughs> of course. Okay. Now, In a very hostile environment. Very hostile. Um, very violent environment. Mm -hmm. Imagine learning the ring without any feeling or only f sensation through mm -hmm. the wheel. It seems like a, a daunting task to me. Um, and we use this anecdote a lot. You know, if it, if it requires athletic performance to handle a race car, mm -hmm. you know, what would happen if we gave Michael Jordan mm -hmm. a basketball filled with helium instead of regular air, and he practiced for two weeks with that helium-filled ball? What would happen to him on game day? Non-reality. That's the, that's the unfortunate truth. You, as you have the ability to train with something that is more of a pure element that, that you experience when you get on the racetrack, that's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal for manufacturers. You know, when, when you look at teams and manufacturers and especially drivers, I, I live my life wanting to be the best. I live my, until it, I still, 50 years later, start eight years old, 2008, retired 2018, right after the Rolex 24, I still consider myself a student of the sport. I still considered, I don't want to leave anything on the table ever. Training, work, I mean, hot yoga, 110 degrees, because sure. it's hostile inside a race car. And, and with that was, was a lot of sim work. Um, we talked, we touched on that earlier. I did a lot of sim work before it was popular. People laughed at me for doing you know, developing our first sim, and they thought it was they thought it was a joke, and I think that was absolutely one of the ways that I was able to weigh into my 50s, um, 56, 57, 58, still be as fast, as durable, as tough, um, win races, lay down fastest laps of the race. You know, all those things come together, and in, in, in including the sim. When was the last time you were in a high downforce car? 2018. Wow. When I walked away, I walked away. You know, when I'm done, I'm done. It's, it's, and I tell people it's a lot like being an alcoholic. I'm not gonna take that next drink. I'm not gonna get sucked down that rabbit hole. 50 years, the, the sports has given me so much. Um, five Hall of Fames, 10 wins at Daytona, I don't know, I think 12 champ 11, 12 championships. So just to go back and win another race or another championship um, after something's given you so much. And uh, every time I got in a car, I broke a lot of things. Um, you know, shattered my heels, shattered my ankles, broke my knees, broke my back, shoulders, wrists, ribs, more head injuries than I can remember. Um, you know, I love this career, but when I was done, I was done. And so when I walked away uh, right after Rolex 24 at Daytona in 2018, I haven't been back since.
driver, the world of driver development, you know, there's, there's two sides of the conversation. There's the engineering simulation technology and the multi-millions of dollars, mm -hmm. which we know what those mm -hmm. sims are capable of. We know that there is driver development solutions and then there's what everybody calls a simulator in, mm -hmm. the, in the world. Mm -hmm. We all kind of get lumped in the exact same category, mm -hmm. which is unfair. Yep. Um, but, you know, you take a look at the, the likes of what you've done in your racing career and done a lot of it without simulation, then started in simulation, and then started advancing and helping more and more manufacturers go down that path. You know, and drivers. And drivers, right? So let's talk about the driver development side. When mm -hmm. you can see the young guns like Sebastian and Oliver Weldon, mm -hmm. like Lucas Palacio, mm -hmm. like Ty Fisher, that have all embraced our technology to take their driver development to the entire next level. Where do you see you know, people like the enthusiast that, that really wants to develop their skills versus someone that wants to go pro, do you put them in the same category or with our technology or are they, you know, are they in a category all by themselves where they don't need simulation technology and their weekends are the best? You know, like, where, do you, where do you differentiate between who needs it and who doesn't? Well, I think that's, that's a very individual thing. I think if it's just the the weekend warrior and depending on what he's look you know is does he want an, an arcade experience or does he want a real world experience those are two very different things mm -hmm. as a driver development tool I see it being most effective as say Jimmy Johnson myself so Jimmy went drove Indy cars um, last uh, not the last few years but two years before that. I came on board with Ganassi. I've been, you know, driving with Chip for 13, 14 years, um, training a lot of my teammates along the way because I, I had a number of different teammates where I had to help train them, yeah. bring them up. Right. And so when I look forward of, of, you know, where we're at right now, and I look back and see drivers, even, even the very successful drivers need help. They need guidance. They need somebody there with them. And I think one, having these effective tools like these simulators is, is just the first step. The next step is having a driver w with them at the simulator to help them. For instance, if I would get in and set the car up, this is what a GTP car needs to feel like. This is Daytona, million miles around that place. This is the bump, this is the line, this is what you got to be careful of. This is okay, this is not okay. If this happens, do this. If that happens, do this and work hand in hand together with them to pound through a bunch of miles so they're getting the right basis for moving forward uh, to attack that track. You know, let's call it the Rolex 24. Um, there's a lot of things that happen and just as we prep the cars and do everything we can before we get to the racetrack, yeah. we need to prep the drivers and do everything we can before we get there. And for young drivers, they need help from an experienced guy. and and. A lot of guys have their, their mentor, their teacher, their helper, their you know, driver development trainer um, that goes hand in hand. So on the track, as well as in the sim, both are important. Let's talk about driver development for a moment. Mm -hmm. The great thing about the manufacturers is they're amazing at the engineering software, but all the drivers are fighting for time. Yes. Um, the engineers are fighting for time. Each team has alloc time allocation to that environment that could be three in the morning. It could be, mm -hmm. I mean, because it's a one-to-one -one environment, you know, on the driver development standpoint, they're not really getting a ton of time to be able to perfect their skills. Um, what would have been like for you having your compact trainer CT chassis from SimCraft back when you first started? Talk well, about driver development for a moment and look what that would have meant to, that's... what, 20 championships? <laughs> <laughs> well, 20 that's, time yeah, family. right, exactly. Um, no, it's, it's, um, it's the reality of, of where we're at. I mean, the big teams take priority, period. And then everything else is the trickle down. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, when you, when you get past the big teams, that trickle down, those are the guys who need it more than the, the big teams. Now, the big teams are out there and they're ra racing for wins and they're racing for championships and that's why they get the priority, right. no question. But what do you do about about young drivers and what do you do about young teams and what do you do about having the ability to bring both of those front and center and get the most out of them and and for me the system that I have at home is is perfect for that because you have the ability uh, as a driver and I mean quite frankly here I am 
you know, growing up and trying to drive anything I can. Mm -hmm. And but you only were able to drive if you were able to connect with a team. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to where we are now. A lot of drivers have simulators. A lot of guys run them. Um, and it still goes back to that same thing where you have to be able to recreate the environment that we live in as, as closely to reality as, as we can. And, and in my view, the system that, that we have, the one I'm driving at home, is, is as good as it gets. And as a driver um, that's trying to make his way up, that absolutely gives him an edge. You know, whether you're running in the GR series or whether you're running in the Cup series or whether you're in the, you know, IMSA and mm -hmm. um, NASCAR, whatever the case might be, you, you need track time. I mean, I, I'll guarantee you right now, all this manufacturer sims, so you have in NASCAR, you have, you have Toyota, you have Ford and you have Chevy. Mm -hmm. You have Coda coming up next week. And I'll guarantee they're running 24 hours a day right now because those guys need the time and not just need the time, but fight for the time. Drivers, teams, everything across the board. First road course race of the year. You can't go testing. How are you going to get that competitive edge? And that's exactly how you get that competitive edge. You know, what, what would be the advantage for a large team that had a roster of 10, 15 people to all drive in unison, give feedback, you know, to the engineers as opposed to like a one-to-one -one environment where only one driver can be on track at a time. If everyone had access to technology like this and we're all running in tandem at a certain mm -hmm. track, what would be the benefit to a team in the, the amount of feedback that they can get from every single one of those drivers? That is, that's a great question. Um, I think m more than anything else right now, we're, we're trying to just deploy um, what I would consider a great tool in, into these environments. And I, and I, you know, as we, as we sit here and talk right now, um, I have a number of teams I'm talking to where I think this would be a great way to deploy. So you have your manufacturer, your manufacturer will support your, let's say, more affordable, smaller systems that can be deployed very much to the race team. Mm -hmm. And where do you stop? You can deploy one to every one of your teams if you wanted to. Right. Uh, the drivers are going to come away with an enhanced reality and or have great preparation before they go to the main sim. Or the sim is full with, with, with all the proprietary teams that are at the top and have the ability to go and do some amount of development and, and driver development and just getting that opportunity to, as an, especially as a NASCAR guy coming up on the first race of the year on a road course, they, they want to get all the time they can get. And, and I'll guarantee that those drivers, if they're not going to the, to the main manufacturer sim, they have their own at home or they're driving something. Uh, and I think it's up to us to be able to get something better in their hands to do a better job. Right before we got into that topic, you had said um, there's a lot of people that have simulation at home or they're evaluating simulation. Um, and then you said that it's important to recreate it as close to the actual environment as mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. It all is about athletic performance in mm -hmm. training and practicing. And racing is the one sport that you don't actively practice your craft to get better. <laughs> you do cardio, right. you do weightlifting, right. you get your body right to handle the, the environment and the conditions, mm -hmm. but you're never really, mm -hmm. up until simulation has really kind right. of taken it to the next level, practiced in your own environment. What do you say to someone that is evaluating other technology or our technology all in one conversation? Because we all get lumped in the exact same thing. There's a right. massive difference between what would be necessary for driver development and athletic performance in building that type of muscle memory versus having a non-motion static unit where they're learning how to race the video game, race the game instead of perfecting their skills. What, what's your recommendation as a seasoned professional decorated? <laughs> More, I, I still believe every moment that you can spend on a proper sim, the better you're gonna be. And what we have is, is a proper sim. Now, if you don't have enough money, and you, you're gonna have to do what you gotta do. However, with that being said, the technology is out there, and I do, I do think we're just moments away from manufacturers and um, series, and um, you know, obviously if you, if you have money, it's easier to get some of these tools than, sure. than if you don't, but being able to have that 
teaching and that time behind the wheel and um, you know, because when they when they see the technology, because it's kind of like everything else, everything it gets developed. You know, when you first came out, we first came out with traction control. Nobody wanted it because it applied the brakes. It actually slowed you down. It didn't work. It didn't work very well at all. But you kept at it, and you made improvement, and you kept at it, and you made improvement. And you went back to the suppliers, and you demanded that they had faster processors, and they could, you know, a faster computer, and they had, you know, they you drove them to be better. Now we are here today, and people wouldn't do anything to move away from traction control. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with the sim. There's been so many different sims out there that create the wrong movement and people get turned off and they don't want to use it and, and they get frustrated. Because I know I've, I've driven enough other sims when I get on them and I go, oh gosh, I hate this thing. You know, it's like, but I had to go through the process to drive it hour after hour. I remember I was on one and it, and it was, it moved and the movement wasn't great and, and the, video monitor was mounted to the sled and it was vibrating and I couldn't keep focus on the road because it was vibrating so bad. I mean, there's, if the tool is wrong, then people aren't going to use it. And just as I made the analogy with traction control, it was so backward initially, but you got to stick with it and, and you got to align yourself with manufacturers that are doing the job that we need right. as a driver, uh, as a team, as a manufacturer. Um, to get that amount of information we need, whether it's driver development or whether we're trying to uh, learn, because we can't test more things about the car to be able to get an edge on our competition. Right. This, this conversation could go in about a hundred <laughs> different directions because you've opened up the can of worms about you know, not recreating the environment. So in the event that you are completely backwards, whether it be motion or not recreating how the, the visuals are connected mm -hmm. to the chassis or the, I mean, there's so many, I, I wouldn't say that the industry is congested with bad product, but it, it can be argued that there's so much in the market that is confusing. And when you're not recreating the environment, we're introducing motion cues to the brain or lack of cues to the brain that don't exist in the real world. And as a driver, you know, people can get sick. There's, mm -hmm. there's, a yep. lot of athletic performance and studies that have been done in regards to what bad technology or lack of motion would do to the brain and how, how your brain is starting to learn a different process altogether. I mean, if we were to flip the physics of this completely backwards on you, you'd have lasted, what, maybe a minute and thrown up in the process? Well, you, you flip the physics for a professional and they can tell you something's wrong. You flip the physics for a non-professional, an amateur, a novice, they don't know any different, so they're trying to drive something that's flawed. And it's no different. When I remember in my IndyCar days at True Sports, we were doing all this development in a wind tunnel, uh, scale model, development of the IndyCar, and we went out and raced it. We, we didn't qualify for the Indy 500. Bobby Rahel took the same car, did not qualify for the Indy 500. All that, uh, all that data was flawed because the wind tunnel was flawed. So you're never going to get good data if you have flawed components, whether it's aero components or whether it's movement components or uh, the steering, the visual, uh, the monitors, all, the, all that. You have to have the, the purity of, of all that stuff. And, and the only way you know that your movement is correct is by putting professionals in it. Um, I, can, I can tell you that from, from all the years of racing, I jump in this thing, I can tell you, it, I get immersed. And, and you can put any other professional driver and let them drive it and, and they'll tell you the same thing. And so when you're when you don't know what to expect, it might be your first time in a sim and you you really want to go racing and um, you want to get some miles at a at a track you've never been at before, how are you gonna do it? And and this is that vehicle that you'll be able to do that. <laughs> It's, it's funny that you, it is the vehicle, right? Because mm -hmm. with the studies that have been done on the hardware and the neurological connection that the participant goes through and the physio and the human response, you know, and as close as this has been rated to reality, it pretty much is a vehicle. Mm -hmm. it, like, it and is. to be able to tune it to exactly how you want it to feel and having it being delivered as your seat type, not my seat time. Yeah. We tune this car for you. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be the baseline for all the drivers that are going to 
utilize our technology is, you know, it's the same thing with our other professional drivers. They all have different disciplines and they all have different levels of development needs. What do you think as far as the degrees of motion and the amount of physics that are on our equipment and the unit that you have at home, what are the, what are the most important motion cues for driver development? Well, you, you, have, uh, you have heave, you have yaw, um, you have all those, you know, all those mo movements have to come together. And the system I have at home, um, because you can, you can fine tune it, um, because every driver wants some, something a little different. Mm -hmm. And it's no different with the, um, even with the big manufacturers and the sims I've drove there. There's, there's, some, there's some subtle things that each driver want, wants to make a little bit more unique for right. them. Now, my, I am gonna give you one little disclaimer, is that if I was training to go to a race, to go racing, I'd be having my suit on, I'd right. have my helmet on, I'd have gloves on, and my brain will totally look at things differently than when you're, when you're doing it in street clothes right. and so on. So let's give you that disclaimer sure, from, from the driving I'm doing. We, have, what, we have pictures of you wearing yeah. your full racing and helmet <laughs> in our equipment too. So, um, so the, all those, it's all those things that come together. And, and so you have all the movement and then you also have all those el other elements. And if you're really, really serious, you're gonna go out and, and, and get the best one that is available. Not the one that everybody's, that, you know, that's the most expensive or the one that is YouTubers are saying, hey, I drive this thing all the time and it's really good. That's not reality. Mm -hmm. you, you need to look at products that are out there that are endorsed by seasoned professionals. I mean, guys who, I've, I've been driving sim for a long time. Um, we talked earlier, before it was, before it was popular. Mm -hmm. And I got laughed at. I mean, I did. I, I took... I took, there was three different manufacturers and I hauled my SIM down to Laguna Seca and I showed them my SIM and how it worked and they came away and they went, no way. All those manufacturers now have their multi, multi-million dollar simulators, but somebody had to be on the front end of that. Right. And so uh, for me, as I you know, sit here and work together with you guys, uh, we are on the front end of that. And uh, we're embarking, I think, on some great new technologies because you know, it's, it's just, it's been baby steps, you know. First we got, okay, let's get a real racing seat. Okay, let's get a curved monitor. Okay, let's get some force feedback uh, through the wheel. Uh, let's get a little bit of movement. I mean, so it's, 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 all, it's been all these baby steps that have that, that continued to develop. And, and, and with that, if the movement that I was doing initially with my sim was wrong, then I just shut it off because every, every step along the way had to give me the feeling of reality. And that's where we are with what we're continue to develop with, with, with our vehicles here. The amount of feedback that we've taken from our professional drivers, and there are a lot of them, it started with Jordan Taylor in 2015, we met you in 2019 originally, mm -hmm. and you've helped us a lot through this process. And if it wasn't for great feedback, and I want to commend you on the amount of feedback that you gave us today and helping us enhance this product, I mean, your time here is valuable. Um, so we really appreciate that. What, what do you, what's your last takeaway from what we did today and what's, uh, what's next for us? Um, more driving. Yeah. Uh, you heard me. I, you know, what do you want to do? I want to drive. Um, and that's still the, the reality of, of where I'm at. I think if we're sitting still, we're falling behind and we're gonna to continue to push this technology forward. I know your team uh, and, and all your uh, members will continue to push that technology forward, mm -hmm. especially with the development of, of some new, um, new products that are coming down the line that, that can give us that opportunity. It all comes through spending more time sitting behind a wheel, which I love doing. We talked about the modularity and the difference between other simulation technology in the industry and what we do for driver development. I don't know if most people know this, but they can get blank chassis and take their existing environment and put it and bolt it onto a yaw platform that we have in our grid one or the Apex, mm -hmm. uh, Apex CT chassis like you have. Um, you know, you don't have to completely reinvent everything that you've already spent to get into our ecosystem and our environment and just continue building on top of that. Um, what value would that have to anybody that has equipment at home just to get even just car rotation in our yaw platform? The biggest thing that, we, that I talk about is an arcade game or an effective tool to go driving. You know, we don't all have unlimited money. You know, we all have a budget that we, that we have to roll in. Right. 
and make an investment in a steering system or a pedal assembly or uh, a shifter if you're doing an H pattern or doing paddles or whatever the case might be and wheels. And I think it's a great alternative to being able to re-implement all those investments you've already made into a system that could take you uh, personally to the, to the next level. Um, because it is, uh, I mean, all this technology is, exp I mean, life is expensive right now. Yeah. Buying a, you know, dozen eggs is expensive. A mm -hmm. gallon of gas in California is, you know, five bucks. So being able to have an effective means to redeploy all those investments you made, I think is, is, uh, is going to work wonders for a lot of guys. And then we know the next level of old dogs learning new tricks. Yep. And we know through the neuroscience studies that people of any age can adapt and pick up simulation technology. And there's you know, HSRs and the SVRAs of the mm -hmm. world where just because you have the means to get that multi-million dollar race car on the track doesn't mean you know how to drive it yet. Right. So driver safety, driver training, I mean, how, what is that like for someone who's a little bit more seasoned in age that still wants that exhilaration on the weekend, but doesn't know how to drive that thing yet. <laughs> I've, I've, I've trained a lot of those guys <laughs> yeah. on, on simulation and, and they love it. I mean, they, they absolutely, when, when they're exposed to it and somebody that can spend time with them to learn Le Mans because they're gonna go race at Le Mans for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, to learn Daytona uh, from a guy that's won that race a lot, um, to really know what he needs to do they, they cherish that opportunity to work together, uh, whether it's myself or, or other professional drivers, because sure. there's other guys doing that, to let them know and understand in a very safe world, because a lot of these guys that, that can afford to have those cars have a different job that they can't afford to get hurt, mm -hmm. break a leg, break an arm, um, or something more serious. Uh, and so the sim is that perfect vehicle for them to train uh, in a very safe environment to go uh, and get on a racetrack. Well, especially being able to perfect your skills at professionally recreated tracks across the world within the, the platform of iRacing. Yep. In your professional opinion, how close in track accuracy is iRacing? iRacing is phenomenal. I think that they're, they're the gold standard by, by far. And what, they, what they've done and how they map the tracks. And I've, I've drove a lot of different sims and some driven by iRacing, some driven by other manufacturers. And iRacing I and the tracks that I know for a fact, I, you know, we were driving Daytona, uh, the bumps, uh, the seams, you look at those, those cues that are on track that I, that I acutely know, and they're, they're true to life. So racers of all caliber from Carters all the way up the ladder to vintage racing professionals of all sorts, yeah. Should have to sim craft, is that veteran. what it is? Should have sim craft, is that what <laughs> exactly. you're saying? Exactly, exactly right. Well, good. Well, we value your time here. Appreciate you stopping by and uh, giving us amazing feedback. It's great to be here. It's awesome. Glad to have you. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs>